Dave, sorry, I'm just looking at everybody. I'm, I'm going to turn my video on in a second. I wasn't sure what the format would be. We're just here. <laughs> there are people sanding my back porch, so I'll mostly be <laughs> muted, I think. It's super loud. I, I, I warned everybody I have cartoons going on in the next room, so <laughs> sorry. <laughs> my new distraction is a puppy. And oh, I took it to daycare oh, because it's a, oh, it's a constant full-time job. <laughs> Nothing like parenting, I know, but um, yeah, so I won't have that distraction. Maria, where are you? What are you sitting in front of? Or is that your fancy background? It's, it's a mural, my favorite mural from Teotihuacan. Oh, I see now. Yes, beautiful. Yeah, everyone's having a party. <gasps> <laughs> All right. Rebecca, how's San Antonio? Are you there or you're remote somewhere else? I'm still in Minnesota. Oh, really? Um, our move got delayed, but going any any day now, probably in a week and a half, um, we uh, we're moving into a place that's been renovated and they weren't done. So we just keep pushing it back, which is nice because we'll get the cooler weather of San Antonio. Um, but everything's going well in terms of teaching. Everything's online. So... <laughs> Well, Mary, I'm going to let you keep your eye on the waiting room, if right. you don't mind. Um, and I think I'm going to get started because it's 2.18 now, and we usually start at 2.10 for these, right? Um, so thanks to all of you for coming. Welcome to the first event of the Fall Archaeology Lecture Series. And Mary has created this lovely slide here for you all to look at, which um, highlights the theme that we chose for this semester. Um, usually we have a series of lectures, but this semester we really wanted to choose a theme, which is archaeology and community. And the reason that we chose this theme is because of the many conversations I had with students that I see on the screen right here, Maria, Melissa, Thea, and others, um, who wanted to know how they could become more involved in community archaeology in a real way, in public outreach in real ways, um, and in communicating science and archaeology to the public. So we'll be having four events over the course of the semester related to Latin American community archaeology starting today, um, indigenous archaeology, black archaeology and race, um, and science communication. And I just wanted to acknowledge the lecture series committee that it's sort of formed recently, um, which is myself, Dr. Mary Clark, and two of our BAMA students, Thea O'Hay and Melissa Hurtado, who are here. So you can move on to the next slide, Mary. And today we are delighted to welcome you to this first seminar, which is called Collaborative Archaeology and Descendant Communities in Latin America. And we have two scholars joining us today. One of them you already know well, Dr. Rebecca Bria, who was recently a lecturer at the U and is now at the University of Texas at San Antonio, though remotely from Minnesota at the moment. Um, and she's come to talk to us about her community archaeology work in Peru. And Dr. Brent Woodfill joins us from Winthrop University to discuss his community-based research in Guatemala. So the format for today um, will be a little different than our regular talks. We'll ask Rebecca and Brent to each talk about their own research in 10 minutes or so apiece, um, followed by questions from the audience. We've already collected a few questions from some of you in advance, but you can raise your hand um, in the participants function or you can type your question directly into chat and Mary will um, field those questions as we go. So now I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca first, if you don't mind getting us started. Absolutely. So Thanks let me so get my screen you. shared, if you'll give me a second. Oh, host dis disabled I'm, participant screen sharing. Let me fix it really quick. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, in the meantime, let me just say, I think it's great that you've chosen this topic for your lecture series this semester, and I'm very honored to be here. Um, to kick it off. And um, is it ready, Mar Mary? Yeah, it should be all okay, set. Okay, yes. Just a second. I'm bad at multitasking. So. Let's see. Okay. Um, so let me move a couple things around on my screen. Okay. So, yeah, so I'll be talking specifically about my work. Um, doing collaborative archaeology uh, with descendant communities in the Highland Andes of Peru. And um, first, I just want to briefly introduce you to the archaeological site that I've been researching uh, for several years now called Wakayan. Um, and then I'll talk 
the majority of the time about the, the work that I've done with the contemporary community of the same name. Uh, so ancient Wakayan was a large village and ceremonial complex that was occupied for um, about 4,000 years in pre-Hispanic times. Um, this occupation, uh, which began at around 2400 BC, uh, spanned until 1480, uh, 1450. Um, and this covers the um, origins of complex society, of agriculture, early religion, uh, through the rise and fall of a variety of societies and political systems, and up until the expansion of the Inca Empire. And a lot of people know something about the Inca, um, and maybe not a whole lot about what came before. Um, but uh, this is a place that wasn't um, heavily, it was under the Inca Empire, but it wasn't a place that where there were Inca present. So that history is less important um, to uh, the story of Wakayan. And um, the archeological site is also quite large. Uh, its architectural core spans around 100 hectares, but there are ancient ter uh, terraces and canals that cover you know, uh, an expanse of about four kilometers across. Um, and the site includes the features you would expect to find of a typical Andean community in terms of habitation areas, agricultural fields, temples, um, and of course, tombs for burying the dead. And one thing I wanna mention about these tombs is that as you can see in this image in the lower right, there's an opening, there's a doorway that um, gave access to the dead and that access is still present today. So uh, people living in this landscape have a very intimate connection to um, the remains of the past and, the, and specifically the dead. Um, it's just a question of, you know, who were these people, right? And, and how do we relate to them um, is something that uh, local people um, have long questioned and struggled with. So um, one other thing I wanna, again, briefly mention about Shaveen, uh, about uh, Wakayan's past is this particular shift between um, Shaveen, which was uh, the Andes first kind of uh, expansive religion, um, and, and also economic network across the Andes. Um, and uh, Shaveen eventually collapses and this new society called Burkwai emerges. And so this transition is something I'm interested in, but what I wanna point out about this transition that's important to my talk is that um, what I'm looking at is how local people like farmers were important to this shift in terms of creating new communities in these really um, extreme moments of cultural change. Um, rather than just focusing on, say, what elites were doing at this time. And so my research, um, I think, connects very well to the concerns of local people in this place, and that's because um, local people today are farmers. And um, these are Quechua-speaking indigenous uh, farmers, and they work on collectively owned land. And the evidence we have in the past is that uh, they too were working out kind of the rules and, and social obligations of how to manage collectively owned resources, the land and the water that they're bringing in through canals. And so um, I, I use this kind of research interest as a bridge to opening up conversations with local people about the past and its relevance um, through kind of common interests. Um, but I also want to point out that um, I believe any work that I do within um, this community and with the community must recognize and respect that their principal concerns and livelihoods are connected to this particular way of life. Um, and it also must recognize the general precarity of small landholding indigenous communities uh, in the modern world. Uh, so Wakayan, like many other communities uh, like it, is a product of a colonial history that has marginalized in indigenous people both economically and socially. Um, and one unfortunate, unfortunate casualty of this history at Wakayan is the loss of knowledge and the diminished value of indigenous heritage in the eyes of the indigenous people themselves. So um, I'm gonna spend a little time now talking about um, the many reasons why there's this kind of disconnect uh, with the past or even uh, a lack of interest in the past with a lot of contemporary um, indigenous community members in Wakayan, um, and how this links to uh, some of the challenges to uh, the preservation of the archaeological remains, things that as archaeologists we are interested in and concerned with. So how do we kind of bridge these, these different concerns? So first, you know, the challenges. 
Um, one of the main challenges that I've kind of already alluded to is poverty. So people are concerned with their day-to-day -day survival, getting their crops to harvest, having enough food to, to uh, survive and thrive throughout the year. Um, and this poverty is linked to um, how, um, you know, the, the process of, of, and the history of uh, colonialism in Peru, which is similar to other places in Latin America, where um, there's, uh, they're of course marginalized from the broader economy, subjugated, uh, but also this is connected to this uh, Christianization that took people away from their ancestral lands and moved them into new villages where they could be easily controlled. This happened in the early colonial period and we're still seeing the fallout of these events. Also connected with this is um, this push for a new mestizo identity um, as Peruvians. So there's, um, it's in the nation's best interest to kind of raise the idea that we are all Peruvian. Yes, we have this varied history, not all of it's great, but you know, we've got this singular shared history now, we're mestizo, um, which has some um, detrimental effects to indigenous identities, as you, you might imagine. Um, and this is further shaped by a nationalized education system that has um, introduced standardized curriculums about the pre-Hispanic past, uh, which does highlight certain indigenous uh, histories, but only certain ones, right? So the Inca, for example, the, the great Inca empire and all its great works, that is taught in schools, but um, children in local schools don't really have an understanding of how that history links to them personally. Um, because they, in fact, were not Inca. They were subjects of the Inca. Um, and then another big one is, is climate change and capitalist enterprise. And um, these things, too, are very linked. So uh, this is kind of ground zero for climate change. This is a glaciated mountain range. While the glaciers are rapidly melting, there's a lot of water, right? So this is going to end up being very detrimental, but right now they're attracting uh, companies like hydroelectric companies who want to um, access the resource and dam um, uh, their, their water flows, essentially destroying the archaeological remains. So that's one of the major threats. Um, there's also now um, export agriculture from Europe, people coming in and saying, hey, let's grow these non-native crops like snow peas uh, for export. And this has caused all sorts of issues like people engaging in wage labor with each other. So community members that are supposedly holding land in, in common are now working for each other. Certain community members are paying others. And um, this has caused all sorts of um, detriment to you know, the, the kind of race for producing the most you can off a plot of land, which you know, at this place, a lot of the land is archeological remains. Um, and here's just a couple images of you know, how you have these snow peas growing on ancient terraces and how you have kind of destruction around the edges. And of course, on the left, you see this, this great flow of water. Um, and then finally, there's also confusion about the heritage laws, right? Who should enforce them? Um, are local people responsible for caring for these archaeological remains when there's no sort of support to do so? Um, and you know, what is our role in telling local people what they can and can't do? So I didn't mean for that to feel like it's kind of off topic, but I think it's really important um, to the broader discussion of how we engage in uh, community-based archeology span and the choices that we make. Um, and so um, I just wanna say that, you know, I think I already mentioned how we're using kind of our, our research interests to bridge, um, our, to, to bridge concerns between ourselves and local people. Um, who you know are facing many of the same challenges that people did in the past. So to counter a lot of the social issues that have contributed to site destruction um, and the devalorization of heritage in Wakayan, um, myself as well as my team worked with community members to co-create different heritage-focused projects. And by co-create, I mean we've uh, collaboratively conceived, executed, and managed right, these different projects. Um, and so they're, they're distinct from traditional outreach programs and that they're created with rather than for local stakeholders. And this is one of the key things that's very simple, right, to say, oh yeah, of course. But um, there's a lot of models out there that you can, you can implement that people have cre created elsewhere that, hey, this was a really successful program, let's implement it here. Um, but one of the things that I, I want you to take away from this talk is that 
um, you, you've, you've got to take that as inspiration, but then bring it to uh, the local people and have the conversations to think about what is actually most important. And you have to have um, essentially buy-in. There has to be some sort of mutual value seen in, in these projects. Otherwise, um, they, they don't really uh, have a life beyond, say, um, uh, an educational talk that you give, right? That, that's great, but what, where is it going to go from there? Um, so uh, we've done this in, in a number of ways. Um, we have first tried to um, bring people into the conversation of the research that we're doing as well as the process of excavating um, and, and doing analysis. And this is very common no matter what project you're in, like archaeology needs laborers, so you pay local people. But what you can do is actually bring them into the scientific process in a more meaningful way. Um, and this can be training in uh, different kinds of techniques. So there's a lot of young adults in Wakayan who are interested in learning the total station because they can then take those skills and work for companies doing surveying. Um, there's also, you know, if you see in the lower left here, I've got an image of uh, three, three young women from Wakayan doing the, um, the profile drawings of an excavation unit. So actually they're, they're producing, right, what's going to be the knowledge uh, from which we then make our interpretation. So they're there part of the process rather than just planning things off and then kind of sending them to the side to watch what we're doing in terms of documentation. We'll hand them the iPad, right, to do uh, the note taking as well when appropriate because literacy is not um, uh, fully shared amongst all members in the community. Um, but uh, let's see, I've already mentioned kind of this, this goal to use the archaeology to improve agricultural livelihoods, specifically by thinking about ways that people in the past solved similar problems they're facing in terms of managing water, sharing uh, these labor obligations um, amongst families. There's a lot of fighting between families, kind of trying to control um, and manage this shared, uh, shared land. Um, also kind of addressing that hegemonic education, there's this, this narrative that's being brought into the schools about their past um, that is just homogenized across all schools. They're trying to kind of get students involved in thinking about what is their particular history and what do they um, want to draw out of it. And all of this is part of an effort to uh, decolonize archaeology in sometimes very small ways, but those small ways I would argue are, are very meaningful and are going to be the most long-lasting. And all of this requires um, long-term investment and engagement in local places. So um, this gets us away from what I would call extractive science, where you go in, you get your data, you do a talk, and you say, okay, that was a lot of fun. You know, maybe see you again in 10 years. I'll come back and, and uh, say hello to your families, right? And that's it. So this does, this kind of model that I've taken does require long-term engagement, but, you know, any sort of uh, meaningful local um, projects that are co-creative, I think, are still meaningful. Um, so just a couple examples of things that we've done. Um, we've done a lot of different kinds of projects in collaboration with the community. Um, and I'll just mention, if it's not clear, that what we're doing is we're bridging uh, the community interests with our own interests. So we as archaeologists are also stakeholders in this. We have things that we'd love to see happen. Um, in terms of, say, the preservation of an archaeological site, but that's what we're bringing to the table, and that can't be all of it, right? Then we bring in the, the local voices and craft something from that. So one of the big events that we did was a com community heritage festival, um, and this is a community that's fairly new and don't have a history of a festival, which is actually very common in most Andean communities. So they're very interested in finding a reason to finally have a community festival to kind of uh, demonstrate their um, importance uh, as a community within the region. And so we kind of brought in, well, why don't we make it, you know, about not only uh, contemporary heritage, but also ancient heritage. So we did things like pop-up museums uh, where people could come and engage with the, with the artifacts. Um, and this was a, a really great event that people came from all over to see, local dances and all sorts of things. We've also done a women's handcraft enterprise um, and this is really hard to get going and continue, but this is um, an opportunity for um, local women to use their skills and traditional craft making, in this case textiles, to um, 
produce things that they see as in, in, in connection with the preservation of the site. So there are tourists who come to the site for hiking. It's a, it's a major base camp for hiking. And there's an opportunity to sell goods, right? So if, if you kind of connect these different economic reasons for um, preserving the site and drawing tourists, Right, you kind of add on to that things that, that increase that economic benefit, such as like selling um, handcrafts. And we also use this as an opportunity to talk about the kinds of themes that might be a part of uh, or, or woven into these, um, these, art, these objects. Um, and so thinking about uh, artifacts, here you see a couple um, archaeological pots put on uh, one of the vessels, but we keep it very open. We want them to express uh, what's important to them. And then of course we've done things like oral history projects in schools where the, the students ask each other about their family history and they go then interview their own um, uh, parents and grandparents asking them about the history. So it's just starting the process of thinking about the founding of the community and then working back from there. And the last thing, I don't know where we are in time, the last thing that I'll um, talk about is the, the most recent project I've been engaged in uh, which is a storytelling project in the schools, um, which provides opportunities for children to um, imagine life in the ancient past. And uh, one way I've opened up these conversations is to have children actually first use photogrammetry to document archaeological spaces and uh, some of the artifacts, uh, which they, they find this process very exciting. Um, but as I see it, the process of actively documenting spaces and artifacts isn't just fun, but it can also demystify and democratize archaeological interpretation while piquing in, uh, kind of curiosity about the past. Um, so once uh, children have intimately engaged with both the things that they're documenting and then on the computer modeling them, that's a long process of studying an object or a series of, say, structures. And, um, you know, in the process, we're thinking about, you know, what people were using these things for and what it, would it look like when they use them. And so we then kind of move into our storytelling phase where we use both art and dialogue to think about uh, what their lives as children would have been like and look like in the very same landscape in which they live. Um, and so we've done brainstorming groups. We've uh, done an art competition. Um, and a series of, of different kind of um, kind of drafts of different uh, pictures about the past. And here I've got one that I'm showing you. I'll blow it up, uh, showing um, an ancient person from the Rakwai culture um, on Wakayan lands with their agricultural fields. And if you remember that canal that I showed you flowing down the mountainside, that same canal was there in the past and it's been refurbished today. And so they know how this landscape works very, very intimately, but now they've put an, an ancient person in, in the landscape. So they're starting to think about, right, what is the story behind these ancient places? Um, and, you know, as an outcome from this, we want to produce um, a graphic novel, maybe a series of coloring books, but, and that's a very common thing that uh, a lot of people are, are doing, which is great, that tells a story about a, a place through a very engaging format. But um, what we want to do is, is take the, the particular images and stories that children have produced and then use those to craft and essentially co-create uh, some of these graphic novel, novels and coloring books. Um, and so putting all this together, um, we think that this could be you know, the, the groundwork for a new approach that bridges digital archaeology and storytelling as kind of a, a new, very cost-effective toolkit for collaborative archaeology that bridges right, the scientific data collection with an interest in just the human experience. So with that, I'll say thank you uh, for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sure there are many, many questions for you, but I'm going to turn it over to Brent now to give his little spiel, and then we can come back together as a group and ask questions of both of you sort of in tandem. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, Y'all can see my screen? We can. Okay, perfect. Uh, so uh, just uh, to orient you first off, um, I work in uh, Guatemala, uh, kind of at the base of the highlands and a little bit in Mexico. And just uh, so you can see, there's only really one archaeological site that makes it into um, most maps. 
uh, in the area. So it is, it is an archaeological site that hasn't gotten a whole lot of attention previously. Um, the, the region is called the Northern Transversal Strip uh, at the base of the highlands. Um, and you can see, actually, uh, this is what the archaeology looks like for the most part, uh, which is one of the reasons why there aren't a whole lot of people who go there. Um, this area is incredibly densely occupied by uh, rural Maya farmers and um, agricultural corporations. So there isn't a whole lot of jungle or um, kind of picturesque ruins to look at. Um, uh, the the Kekchi Maya are the majority of the people who live in the area and they live in the ruins. Um, I can't tell you how many mounds I have found that I would really love to trench into, except there's a latrine in them. And um, so I'm not really that interested in seeing what they left behind recently. Um, but uh, you know, when I first came into the area, um, I, I was really interested in looking at uh, caves and trying to understand uh, Maya ritual activity in the region. Um, and I ran into a lot of the same problem uh, that Rebecca mentioned, this kind of idea that we're doing um, extractive science. Uh, I spent a lot of time trying to convince all of the rural Maya people that I was actually, it was okay, I'm a scientist. I'm not an oil company. I'm not... Um, I'm not doing anything extractive. All I'm doing is going into the most sacred places where people are still performing ritual activities, digging holes, extracting all the materials, and then shipping them to a laboratory in Guatemala City. Um, and I realized that it, we are incredibly extractive. <laughs> and um, the, you know, the, especially starting, um, yeah, I started doing research in this area in 2000, which is four, hour, four years after the Guatemalan Civil War officially ended. And this is one of the hardest hit areas in the war. So there were a lot of distrust of outsiders anyway. And just some like random gringo walking in um, and saying, hey, I, I'm interested in doing field work uh, here just wasn't a very um, productive approach. Um, and a lot of this, as I found out and started actually talking to the people, is because as an archaeologist, I was thinking of the caves and the archaeological sites as places and contexts uh, for archaeological investigation, whereas the Maya actually viewed them uh, as beings they called Tzul-Tapaz, which means literally hill valley. Uh, Tzul is hill or mountain and Tapa is valley. But these were considered to be living beings, uh, the kind of the physical manifestation of these living beings who controlled the landscape, owned it, and they had to, the Maya had to uh, ask permission and leave regular offerings in order to be able to plant, harvest, pass through uh, their, um, the, the land that they owned or else bad things would happen. Um, and, uh, I, I, so I kind of started to understand that the Maya viewed things in a very different way than um, we do, which led to an interest that I was talking about earlier with um, Barry or Dr. Clark about in ontology. But anyway, um, I realized that there was a much more complex relationship uh, with the archaeological sites that was making things harder for me to work there. Um, the, the, end goal for my research was to understand uh, how this area was important for ritual and exchange, or for, for trade and exchange, uh, because it was between the highlands and lowlands. It was along one of the main trade arteries connecting the ancient Maya world. Um, and a lot of archeologists have talked about this and the ritual important, or the, the, the economic importance of these trade routes in the past, but Archaeologists have major blind spots, and one of them is that this isn't just something in the past. Uh, this continues to be one of the main trade arteries in the present, and it continues to be uh, heavily fought after. Um, it, during the, so, I mean, 
uh, there are a lot of goods that are still produced in the area and a lot of others, legal and illegal, that are uh, uh, brought through them. Um, and this area, you know, when I was writing my dissertation, I was looking at how different um, groups kind of came in. Uh, Tikal, which was a major Maya city, um, tried to um, take over the area, establish a hegemony in the early classic. In the late classic, Kalak Mul came. And we talk about these like uh, foreign groups coming in in the past, but we have a blind spot to also like the Setas. And uh, you know, the, the narco gang is based there, um, or the drug cartel. Also, um, um, a lot of major corporations have major operations in the area. Um, during the Guatemalan Civil War, this was fought over um, really intensely. This was one of the hot spots uh, where um, how, you know, I think close to 400 villages were wiped off the map in Guatemala during the Civil War. And a large chunk of that was in the northern transversal strip. Uh, and uh, the land uh, that the villagers were able to maintain a, a control of went from being kind of community or family run to individual titles, uh, where each family got their own land title through USAID. Uh, a lot of times they were too small uh, it, to actually be something that a family could use every year, but they wanted to make sure that it was individual titles because of, you know, capitalism. It was the Cold War. Um, after the Civil War ended and during the end of it, you had a lot of missionaries coming into the area. Uh, and more recently, um, transnational corporations. So everything from the Asetas a lot of palm oil, a lot of hydroelectricity, um, or hydroelectric dams uh, have been um, have kind of sprung out throughout the area that are flooding archaeological sites and communities. Um, you have uh, entities called casas de préstamo, which are like the fast, fast cash now uh, companies that show up in marginalized communities here in the United States that are giving like, you know, high compounding interest loans to uh, villagers uh, who have to put their land title up as collateral, often end up using it. And then that uh, is then bought by a corporation in order to uh, expand their uh, palm oil uh, plantations. So there are a lot of major problems in these, the, the, this conquest in the past uh, continues into the present. Uh, the, this road, uh, the Northern Transversal Highway, was just paved a couple of years ago, um, and the whole area is being electrified. Uh, cell phone towers are coming up, which is leading to rural gentrification that is forcing a lot of people out of their land. Um, and so coming into this situation, uh, as an archaeologist, I have really tried to spend a lot of time thinking about how I can actually um, take a side and help out the, 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 the villagers have some sort of support. Um, not to be like some white savior who comes in, but uh, someone who does have international connections, uh, access to... Um, kind of social ties, um, the ability to raise funds and some technical skills. Um, and so this started in the early 2000s when I was uh, working on my dissertation on Arthur Demarest's project, um, where a lot of my dissertation was actually funded by the U.S. Agency for International Development, where I was part of a team composed of... Uh, the Guatemalan government, some applied anthropologists, and uh, some Peace Corps people, and then local community leaders and NGOs uh, that end up transforming the second largest uh, cave system in the Maya world into a national park that was co-managed by um, uh, two villages that lived either adjacent to or within the park bounds. 
Uh, and we end up setting up tourist paths, did a lot of training, and then so used, uh, they kind of did all of the archeological survey in order to document and um, uh, allow the park to go forward, give an argument for why this should be a national park, created a guidebook and did a lot of guide training for the local people. Um, and um, this, the Candelaria Park happened in 2004. And a few, it actually became a major uh, source for not just national tourism, but also local and regional tourism. Uh, so in 2008-ish, another community that was a few hours away uh, ended up visiting the site, uh, the Candelaria Caves National Park, and wanted to set something up uh, that was similar. In this case, uh, something that was based on a little patch of forest that was standing um, and uh, uh, atop a salt dome uh, with a brine stream and then some salt flats with a big archaeological site around it called Salinas de los Nueve Cerros. And um, so they end up reaching out to a colleague of mine uh, who got in touch with me and we came out and visited it in 2009 and saw that they had already set up a pretty cool little um, local ecotourism project. Uh, the top of the salt dome has like this weird Pepto-Bismol pond. Um, sometimes it's purple, sometimes it's green. It's very strange. Um, and a couple of paths that end up going around the, um, uh, going around the salt flats. And, uh, they wanted us to join as a part of this uh, larger ecotourism project. Um, unfortunately, they were, the communities were simply co-managing the land and the actual owners of the land were a municipality. Uh, that was uh, right before I came down, was taken over by a pretty uh, anti-indigenous or military affiliated party that ended up um, destroying the ecotourism project, tried to shut down the archeology. span We've never been able to do any work within the park or the proposed park. Instead, we were working in people's cornfields in the like 10 villages that surround this ecotourism facility or well, uh, this uh, municipal land. But we've still been able to do a lot of uh, archeology. span We've been excavating this would have been our 11th field season, um, although obviously we weren't able to go down this year. Um, and our project has uh, been able to do a lot of excavation, a lot of survey. Um, over the years, more villages have allowed us onto their land in order to do an archeological investigation. Um, and one of the ways that we've been able to make sure that uh, this has happened uh, and that villagers are happy to see us is because of our abilities to, uh, in, to uh, bolster local initiatives uh, to address local problems. Uh, the lack of water being one of the big ones. Uh, the water table during the height of the rainy season is maybe about um, 40 to 60 centimeters under the surface and it drops down to 10 to 12 meters during the height of the dry season. And so uh, it's really hard for them to build wells that are able to, uh, uh, to draw water all year round. Um, and uh, so we've been working with local initiatives to increase access to water. And um, this focus on water has also led to some interesting conversations. Like we have noticed that a lot of the ancient water management systems this is actually a classic Maya Aguada or water hole that was redug and repurposed as a contemporary um, uh, water source for one of the families. Um, and uh, so um, we spent a lot of time talking with people about their needs, how they're addressing their needs, um, coming up with different ways of um, of uh, finding solutions, which ended up leading eventually to us founding, uh, well, paying for the uh, founding documentation of an NGO 
that was run by leaders from the region. Uh, the first couple of years, every year since we started, I tried really hard to do my uh, to, to do community development. In my first couple of years as an archaeologist, I was running the archaeology and the community development, and I'm not that good at it. I'm really good at digging holes in the ground and pulling up dead people's garbage and writing gossip about them. I'm not quite as good at actually like coming up with sustainable uh, plans for community development. But we were able to have a full-time cultural anthropologist uh, who did applied anthropology on staff. And we've been able to keep that going most of the 11 years. And um, this association um, was composed of all of the people who'd spent 20, the, the previous 20 years as fixers and translators for all the development people who'd come into the region and got their own platform. At which point the applied anthropologists, the whole purpose was just to strengthen their ability to uh, ask for money and ask for, um, or arrange their own development themselves. Um, even coming up with little things that the villagers would not have otherwise thought of, like it was originally called Ach Quatlicinel Granja Transversal del Norte. Um, it's now called Adawa because it's really hard to write. Asociación Indígena Campesina Ach Quatlicinel Granja Transversal del Norte on a check um, or Google it. Um, just so you can see, I'll, 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 this is the last slide that I'll leave up as I'm talking. Um, the goal that we have had has been um, to find where our interests dovetail with the locals when possible. But at the end of the day, what's more important is figuring out where our knowledge and skill sets uh, can help the other person. So um, a lot of the Maya in the region have maybe a second or third grade education. So training people as archeologists um, is something that needs a college degree that's outside of the realm of possibility for many people. Uh, and without access to fresh drinking water and sustainable income, heritage is important, but a lot less important than being able to eat and drink. And so, um, we do some things that are related to heritage, but also we do a lot of uh, survey work uh, when they're trying to actually legalize their terrain, help people write grants, um, do fundraising, things that have uh, nothing to do with our interests, but are based in our skill sets, just like um, having the locals show us where the archeological sites and where the caves are that we would not otherwise know, even though they might not be super interested. And so we're both kind of uh, partnering with the others uh, in a much broader way. Um, anyway, and we've been able to get a lot, a lot of good stuff out of it. Uh, it's been hard, we've gotta be super flexible and things invariably fall apart. Uh, the guy who was our main um, uh, our main connection to the region, who is in charge of Adawa, uh, for like since it was founded eight years ago, uh, he died of COVID two weeks ago, and that ended up. Um, I mean, we still don't quite know how we're going to go forward because we have invested a lot of our time and expertise in him because he was free to do all of this stuff, and it's unclear uh, what is going to happen. So. You have to be very flexible and things will never necessarily work out the way you want it to. But we keep trying. Anyway, that's pretty much uh, my part. Great, thank you so much. We're sorry you've lost your friend. Um, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Mary since she's compiled some questions and she will take questions from the audience. We have time for a few questions and to have more of a conversation with Brent um, and Rebecca. So I want to thank you guys both for sharing so much of your work with us. Um, you know, these really long projects give us a sense of, you know, the arc of that research, both in the conception and in the application and then uh, everything that can kind of come out of it. And I'm really grateful that we were able to kind of bring that into this community. Um, so one of the questions that we have uh, from um, our BU archaeology community is, 
thinking about the strategies of beginning these conversations. So you've both kind of talked about how there's this sense of co-authorship, both in uh, devising the research strategies and the community work, but then also that, that reciprocality that you were talking about, Brent, where it's not just about um, you know, bringing everybody into the production of archeology, span but it's also thinking about how you know, you're aiding me in my research, but let me see how I can aid you in your, your endeavors. So I wanted to see if you guys can give us a sense of how we can kind of begin these conversations, look for funding to support them, to maintain them, and kind of give us some clues on uh, strategies for starting off uh, this type of work. Uh, would you like to start, Rebecca, or should sure. I? I mean, I would just say, first let me just say how I started, which was without a plan, and then realizing how important this work was, um, when I was already in the field. So um, I had uh, community collaborations, but it was very, very vague. And there weren't these kinds of discussions going on. And I think I was really the only one who seemed to care in my department at the time, not everyone, but you know, it just wasn't really a, a concern about engaging in these things. So I went down to the field um, kind of naively thinking, I'm gonna do something with community, but I had no idea what it was. So what I would say from my experience is, now start with a plan in terms of time, collaborators, and money, no matter how small um, that you have, say, as part of your dissertation research, and have something uh, ready to go, not necessarily a complete uh, patient uh, workshop with a workbook and all these things forever to keep going, but a plan to get started so that when you engage in that first conversation with the community, you have um, local ex experts that you've already talked to and, um, and through how this collaboration is going to go and then kind of go together. Um, you want to um, make sure that you've actually set aside time um, in your project to get these, this work done and have these conversations. Um, and then um, with, with the money, um, I think we're kind of, we've experienced a paradigm shift where you know, some of the money that we have for research has to go to the community in some way, um, whether it's a collaborative project or sometimes people just give money to the community to do what they need to do with it. But I advocate for a more collaborative kind of approach, of course. Um, and in terms of like the conversations, they, they can be very contentious and you have to be prepared for that. Um, it's not all, hey, we're here to help. Um, it's going to be great. There's a lot of different voices that are that you're going to hear when you walk into a community setting. Um, people are going to want you there, some of them, and others are not going to want you there. And you have to be ready for that and you have to be respectful for that. So I think that goes into the planning. It's just preparing yourself for, you know, maybe this isn't going to be so easy. So starting with projects that might give you an entry, like working with schools and doing fun activities and getting to know local people um, in these ways. And then through that process, you're going to start to learn what's important to the community and what the needs are and continuing those conversations. Uh, and I think the, the, the standard model of archaeology that all you need to do is go into the government ministry and write an application and then show people your paperwork uh, is like a very comforting fiction. But also, um, you know, uh, I work in Guatemala, roadblocks are a thing. Um, people will actually chop down trees and trap people inside and hold them for ransom. <laughs> and so uh, every, any archeological project does involve like actually interacting with uh, the locals. Um, I'm just starting work in Mexico and the way that I ended up um, kind of working on that side uh, was, um, I spent a summer just exploring different archaeological sites in the region, talking to communities, seeing if they had any archaeology, seeing if they were interested, walking into a community and calling a meeting, which would sometimes take a couple of hours, um, and then um, negotiating and seeing if there was anything that was of interest to me and seeing what people had interest in doing. And um, it gets easier once you've done that a couple of times, people will find you, especially if you stay in the same region for long periods of time. 
um, you can just hop around um, as you are invited into areas. Because getting that invitation is the best, the best uh, possible scenario. Absolutely, yeah. And I think you know what you guys mentioned was there's both this this dichotomy of you know finding the communities, but then in certain instances the communities already exist. Um, and so Rebecca, you mentioned sort of this outreach and kind of um, getting to know schools and, and populations in the area and finding that as the way in. And Brent, you were talking about sort of just being present and having conversations with everybody that's there. Um, do you guys have any advice for those of us that are attempting to begin these conversations with these populations when um, many of us kind of have this methodological training within the field of archaeology, but then uh, engaging in those conversations might not necessarily be our backgrounds? try really hard not to think as an archaeologist. Um, we tend to be super, I, I just pu published some of this stuff in a, an article and one of the reviewers said, well, yeah, the, all of this stuff is nice, but you need to focus on how to train more archaeologists and focus on like how to make heritage important to these people, which is just stupid and useless. Like, um, meet people where they are. Don't project who you think they should be onto them. Yeah, to that point, I would say don't expect or expect that you will start to care about things you never thought you would care about. You know, it might be like Brent was talking about the well, right? You probably dug a lot of wells by now and you never thought that you would. Um, all of these things, right, they, they, it opens up so much to you. Um, and in terms of getting going, in my own experience, I spent uh, a summer just getting the project set up, right? We were doing mapping and those kinds of things, but we're mostly talking to people. We're living in the community. We're establishing the narrative and that's time consuming. And I understand time to degree is an issue and uh, you might not have a complete summer, but if you have mapping to do, consider that your time to engage and get to know people, know their names, know who's part of what family, know what they care about, where their land is. Um, and that's how those conversations are gonna start. I would also say when you come in and start these conversations, don't make promises you can't keep. And this is something I've learned the hard way in terms of you know, saying, oh, we're gonna create this and we're gonna do that. And, um, you know, some of that was um, naivete, some of it was miscommunication in terms of just kind of brainstorming things like that we might want to collaborate on, narrative of we haven't done this yet. So, uh, so you know, it, um, be very clear who you are, what you're capable of, but it, you know, if you do have an interest in doing a long-term project, right, talk about the process that's involved um, and yeah, expect, expect to put in the time. <laughs> And I, I will emphasize, live in the community if you can. Yeah. Um, yes. Go to people's houses for dinner. Uh, pay, pay a family to feed you and go hang out with them if you can. Uh, when people invite you to weddings and baptisms, um, show up. Have extra coffee. Um, incredibly sweet if you're in Guatemala. Um, just for, pe like for people when they stop by. I think, that's, I think that's great. So I'm going to just add one more question before we wrap up. Um, so you guys both talked on the point of extractive science. It's sort of moving away from this, um, this I guess, I mean, clearly antiquated practice of sort of showing up, taking the things that you need and then leaving and then sort of having uh, a temporary or maybe a seasonal interaction with a community and then leaving with the things that you want and then the community paid for their time as they interact with you uh, is left without any legacy of that, um, that relationship. And so moving away from that, I'm sort of thinking about, um, you know, what would be some of the biggest takeaways from your guys' experience that sort of show that that's um, something that not only needs to continue happening, but should be the way in which we sort of move forward in the, in the field of archaeology. Um, yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So some of the things I think about are both successes and failures. So for example, you know, one of the things that we as archaeologists just selfishly want is to halt the, the ongoing destruction of the site. And we completely understand why people destroy 
Well, they, need, they want to expand their fields, right, so that they can better uh, survive. Um, but that's encroaching into the, the core of the archaeological site. So has that stopped since we started these initiatives? Not at all, especially when you have new challenges that emerge like uh, international agribusiness, right, and giving new initiatives for people to put more land under production. And so that's, that's an argument for the need to continue these conversations. It's always going to be a new problem um, in the modern uh, world that's going to be uh, needing to be addressed. So, um, you can try to have, even if you leave, some sort of legacy in terms of local university students maybe establishing a, a relationship with that community and continue conversation there. Um, but also like thinking about the successes, right? So I'm thinking of the long term in terms of the adults often have their ideas about how the world works and that's fine, right? It's hard to, to initiate something new. The children are more open, right, to thinking about it more critically where they want to kind of see archaeology in their future um, and what it means to them. And so that's playing the long game. You're not going to see a return. But even with the, the young uh, adults, right, that are now coming to become community members, they, um, they have more of a, a sense of connection to these remains and see its value and are at least bringing that to the discussions uh, in the community. And so, um, so yeah, you have to be ready for the successes and failures, but um, that, that continued engagement is so key. The, I will say the um, also like if you're going to truly decolonize archaeology, that means like separating all of your knowledge and tools and skills from the process of archaeology and from you just using them for your own ends. Um, we still <laughs> extract materials and bring them to the laboratory in Guatemala City, but we have spare bedrooms in the laboratory so that when people are in Guatemala City because of medical problems or um, meetings or other things, they have a place to stay. Uh, we actually have people from the region who, are, who live in the laboratory and are finishing up their undergraduate degrees um, in Guatemala uh, at the National uh, University. And we have um, annual meetings at the end of each field season with big ceremonies uh, and a big dinner and um, a bilingual lecture in Spanish and Kekchi uh, that turns into like another opportunity for discussing. Um, the whole basic philosophy of our project is basically the campsite rule. We're not trying to transform the area into something perfect in our eyes, but like trying to make sure that we're able to leave it in a better place than we found it and also help to make sure that when we leave, uh, because every archeological project ends, that we're not pulling all of their access and all of their opportunities away, but making sure that they are able to continue to do their own thing. Can I add to that really, really, really quickly is just to say that if there's any way to keep the remains in the community, which is very difficult, um, to do so. And I found a way to do that just because uh, there's no storage in the city and the museum where they're supposed to, their remains are supposed to go. So they've stayed locally, but I fought for that too and got the um, permission to keep them there. So that is another really powerful way for people to maintain control over their heritage. I think that's great. Um, and we've got a question from um, Melissa, who's uh, on, on the committee to organize these talks. So go ahead, Melissa. Um, sure. So uh, I had two quick questions, uh, and I guess I'll ask them um, at the same time, but feel free to answer them um, individually. I don't know. So the first one is for Dr. Bria, and I guess this is more um, for like advice for students, and like maybe you can um, answer in the way that like would benefit students, but um, you talked about like your department maybe not talking about you know community archaeology and there wasn't a lot of talk about this when you were creating this. Um, so what inspired you at first to start this project but also to continue it despite not a lot of people um, talking about it um, because we don't really see a lot of this like even in our classrooms we don't talk about like community archaeology or how to engage with like 
um, with community-based archaeological methods. And then, so that's the first question. Um, and then the second question is for, I guess, both of you. And um, what literature helps you create these new methods or build on new methods? So I'm currently reading this book, Community-Based Archaeology, and it's a really good book. So I was wondering if you had other literature that inspired you or has helped you, um, because I am very interested in this as well. So those are the two questions. Um, okay, so I'll start with your first question for me. Um, and I, I will say it was very organic in terms of my interest in this. Um, comes from first working in Peru and other places in Latin America for many years before I started my dissertation research where it was kind of all on me to get the work done. And I had um, some you know, good examples, but mostly it was through sustained interaction with local people and realizing what their concerns were, were and then also getting smacked in the face with the reality that you know, not all indigenous people have this, this kind of idealized connection to their ancestral past, that that past has, that connection has been broken, right, through colonialism and uh, state nationalism and all sorts of things, uh, capitalism. And so, um, and so that was kind of a, a wake up call for me, um, as well as a call to action to see how I can be a part of, um, you know, raising first it was more like i want to raise the value of like the true history of of the indigenous past right and then realizing that you know are the narratives that we create in archaeology yes they're based in in real data but they're still narratives and that narrative can be shaped by other voices and um it's really that ongoing conversation with local stakeholders right that start to shape a new uh way to think about how we reconstruct the past and why it even matters right if it only matters to me and it doesn't matter to the people there, why are we doing this, right? If it's, it's not even my history, I am, um, you know, a, a white female from North America with European ancestry. So, um, so it's kind of, you know, all these things coming together um, that made a reality. I mean, if, if you live and work with people for a long time, it's, it's hard to just say, you know, thanks for the data, see you later. Um, so uh, there's that. Um, in terms of other literature, there's so much right now that's coming out in terms of um, case studies for um, community-based archaeology that I can to. There's um, Sonia Atale's book is great, right? The community archaeology book that we showed because you know this is this is also a new uh, beginning for indigenous scholars, right? To to engage in this research in a different way that maybe I do, right? As kind of an outsider. And, and kind of uh, with their own community to right, construct this, these narratives and, and raise the value of their history. Um, but there's other things like um, Patricia McEnany's work and um, uh, was it El Salvador or Honduras um, working with the, the Chorti Maya? Yeah, uh, Honduras. Yeah, she did a lot with the kind of similar storytelling kinds of things and working with schools um, those kinds of, of studies that are very robust and have longevity um, have really inspired me to think about, right, not just what project can I do this summer to make a change, but like how can I actually craft a program um, that will have some sort of effect maybe even 10 years down the road. The, the book that inspired me the most, which I only found out about because it was in the like employee recommendation section of Louise Erdrich's bookstore in Minneapolis was uh, Decolonizing Methodologies by Linda Tua Highsmith. Well, it's phenomenal. Um, uh, I'm, I'm Arda Sen's Development is Freedom has some good things in there, but it's geared towards a different audience. And there's a really weird book that does actually have some good um, models and things to think about called Empowering Communities Through Archaeology and Heritage by Peter Gould that just came out. Um, although it's in this weird sweet spot where the, he, the four projects he talks about have uh, like are too small scale for most development people, but have, involve way too much money for most archaeological projects, but it still has some good ideas in it. Thank you. I'll send you a, a list as well if you want. 
Yeah, definitely. I was just going to say that I, I think I was muted, that I can see a class developing out of this, Melissa, very easily. Um, and maybe we can start a document where we can share some of this stuff with students. And I can see people sort of leaving now because the, our time is coming to a close. But um, I do see that Franco also has a question. So I'd love to hear Franco's question and then we can begin to, to wrap up. Yeah, I, those of you who have to leave, head on out. But I, thank you, Brent. Thank you, Rebecca. Those were really wonderful talks and really interesting. Brent, as a fellow archaeologist working in Guatemala, um, I wanted to kind of, I guess, ask both of you, one of the things in Guatemala, it's both a legacy of colonialism and really tied in with that history of extractive archaeology, is the amount of projects, our own, being one of them that's located up in Peten. And, you know, it's this area that is, you know, there are communities up there, but many of the archaeological sites aren't expressly associated with particular communities. Many of them are, are, are included, you know, you pass through a city, Washatun, which actually started off as an archaeological camp. And that's kind of the go-to launch point for many projects up in that region. Um, and, but then, you know, in thinking about how to frame our own, you know, this own or, or this particular site within a, a community, um, you know, to take this kind of approach in that kind of landscape, you know, we're a site that's between two concessions. And I was just curious if, um, you know, what that means is that two different areas have interests in, in any development that would be associated with that site. Uh, um, and in the Paten, tourism's kind of one of these things that's not only a, a priority for many communities up there that could benefit from it, but also on the part of the government as well. So just, just I'm, I'm curious if, if in your own experiences, um, you know, have you had to deal with this, you said there's a lot of examples of contested um, kind of claims, but have you had to deal with anything like that where, where you might have, you know, a, a real difficulty in establishing claim and it being contested in a certain way and really having to think through negotiating that? Um, I don't know if that question's clear. Brent might understand more what I mean because I think you might understand the situation in Patent a little more just so because it's the thing, but... So one of the things to keep in mind that a lot of people forget, and there's a huge debate exploding in Guatemala around the archaeological site of El Mirador. Oh, yeah. And um, the, which is not too far from where you work, Franco, mm -hmm. um, but, um, and Mary, uh, but it is, the whole thing is the Maya Biosphere Reserve, which is this big national park that's the northern part of the country of Guatemala was actually established during the Guatemalan Civil War. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons it was established was because it was, it provided a justification for the military to come in and pull out anyone who was there and force them into like these model villages. Mm -hmm. As soon as the Civil War ended, the narrative turned from like, well, these are guerrillas or revolutionaries or communists to these are drug traffickers or smugglers and the war again like the basically the the national parks are set up as militarized zones to justify um pulling people out and the whole environmental movement has been militarized in guatemala mm -hmm. and so you kind of have to keep that in mind when you are working there that well, like what i was just gonna because that's like i think of that mostly within like the the kind of resettlement things i'm thinking of like with with the western area of that biosphere but it's i know that there's also concessions in the east where it's perhaps less stigmatized in terms of the drug trafficking because it's less on the kind of pass-through zone that everyone talks about mm -hmm. um but there's still communities that are kind of involved in any kind like the concession plans that's up for debate as part of this whole el mirador issue is kind of what i'm talking about but in a setting that's where what you're describing isn't happening at the same scale. I'm just, because I'd be curious, like, because I know you know this intimately. I'm sorry if this question is highly specific, but it's, it's interesting because you, you're, you're working in this in Guatemala. And I, like, I just, I've been trying to think through it. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, like, it's easy for archaeologists to ignore possible shareholders in the North yeah. Yeah. and um, also prioritize the environment over the community which is, which I just think is abhorrent and mm -hmm. stupid. 
Um, but uh, I think that um, if you can identify local shareholders, that will help you out. And the easiest shareholders to identify are the people on the road who can actually block you from being able to get in or out by putting down a single tree. Like, <laughs> if there aren't any other shareholders, there are always them. Um, and your, your going back and forth affects their, their livelihood. But you do have to pick sides. Like a lot of my, I, I, the, village, the archeological site that I've been working at for 11 years, ha, it's split up in two municipalities and then a little bit of the per, periphery is in Mexico. And it's uh, divided up amongst like 32 villages. Uh, and so there are a lot of shareholders and a lot of like private fin like uh, finqueros, like plantations. Um, and so you have to, at a certain point, try, try to work with everybody. But if there's a conflict, I mean, I, I, I've picked a side. To add to that, I would say, um, if I can, that, um, you know, our goal in terms of thinking about working with descendant communities isn't always, let's figure out which of the descendant communities today can claim right ancestry to this place. Because land claims are very contentious, as we know, and um, claiming history is how uh, people have often laid claim to land. And so um, there's got to be a sense of the, the narrative that's being produced is not about one particular place over another people. Again, you're going to have different communities want different outcomes and uses uh, of, of the archaeological site. And so that's what you kind of have to, to manage. But um, it's never easy. <laughs> and sometimes you can never come to a, a decision that everyone's happy with. Uh, but at least in terms of, you know, drawing connections between the site and communities today, you have to kind of keep it somewhat open, uh, at least regionally, right? <laughs> but it's tough. And development, uh, like descendant like, communities is a very broad topic. Like the, the Maya, the, the Kekchi Maya with whom I work, mm -hmm. were actually based up in the highlands and came down in the 20th century because they were escaping like slave-like conditions among German coffee plantations. Mm -hmm. The indigenous community that was there at the time of the Spanish conquest were all pulled out in, uh, at the end of the uh, 17th century and ended up on the south coast of Guatemala, near Retaluleu. That's where the troll went to disappear. Um, and so descendant communities and marginalized communities, because there are a lot of Ladinos as well, like, you know, you can, you can think about more broadly, who are the people who, like, could most benefit from your presence? All right, we actually have, sorry, I'm gonna pivot really quickly. We have um, David's questions that came in through chat. Um, David, do you wanna go ahead and pose those or you want me to read them? <laughs> oh, let's see. Um, I thank you both for very interesting ideas um, to apply to our own work in Mexico. I'm just curious how in Peru and Guatemala, like what I, I deal with in, in central Mexico are, are just the, the intersectionality of identity and stakeholders and um, thinking about, you know, populations that identify as mestizo versus in Indio or indigenous, um, how local collaborators, whether sort of academic or um, associated with, with, you know, other governmental institutions, et cetera, uh, there's, there's obviously so many concerns there and um, and how you approach those differently, if at all, like how salient it is to um, your context or your local communities of like that identification with the national sort of mestizo projects versus, um, you know, identifying with, with an indigenous heritage, or in fact, if, if some of the identification is just more localized, it's the community, it's the town or the municipio or something like that. Um, and I imagine it could be all these things, and it, whether it you know shifts over time or where you know what how you how you act relative to how sort of community members are voicing their concerns and 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 a basis in in a certain identity for them. I think that's a great question. 
and, and a really tough one that I certainly struggle with these issues because first, like you're saying, in terms of you know when indigenous identity versus a mestizo identity is emphasized, it's, it's pretty situational amongst the same community at any given time, depending on whether they are in their community at the moment or in their, their nearby city selling their goods. Um, if they're doing work with the government in some way, right, they're going to project um, a different kind of concern about, you know, their, their role in the Peruvian state or their role as an indigenous person. So um, I find that uh, there's, there's a, been a push for a long time to move away from being indigenous in order to have your children right, speak Spanish and be most successful in uh, the market today. And so there's, there, that's another thing that's devaluing indigenous identity and history. And so that's really challenging to come in and say, okay, let's, let's all valorize you know, our indigenous pasts, right? And so, um, and so you definitely have to kind of be aware of these things that deeply before you start kind of talking about uh, what archeological remains mean to um, living people, right? And, and kind of opening up those conversations. And I guess my best, approach to this issue is thinking is what I talked about in uh, my talk which is thinking about ways in which your study about what people did in the past whether you want to identify yourself directly with those people or not that their lives actually um, and the way that they they um, their community resources bears some importance to the way that you do things today on the same plot of land challenging uh, you know the same kinds of problems that that we need to find solutions to. So kind of finding some sort of connection to that past, regardless of whether you see these people as your ancestors or not. Mm -hmm. And the other part of this too is religion. So um, especially people that are now evangelical rather than um, kind of indigenized Christians, they uh, don't want anything to do with um, the archeology span and the way that people did things in the past because, right, it's just, it's wrong, um, it's heresy. And so um, that's another thing that we need to be careful about. So it's, it's more about learning from the past and um, being the best community that we can be today, right, through understanding the past and maybe preserving it for, say, things like tourism, things that most people can get behind uh, for the benefit of their community. Uh, the, there's a huge split between evangelicals and Catholics uh, where I work as well. I mean, uh, Rios Montt in the 1980s, the worst dictator, he targeted Catholics. So Guatemala became the most evangelical country in Latin America. Uh, but the evangelicals, when they started working, referred to the Tzultapaz, these, these geographical idiosyncrasies that uh, were had to perform ceremonies, the, the supernatural owners of the land, as demons, and they ignored them. And they've started to come back to it in recent years. Um, uh, the same way that Catholics have embraced the Tzulpikas, the Maya have. The last ceremony I did was actually in an evangelical community, and they actually had a uh, Maya spiritual leader come and lead a ceremony. And they said, well, this isn't religion, this is culture. But uh, the, no one I work with claims any ancestry to the people of the area. Like, they're, they're Kaichi Maya. And they refer to the people who lived there in the past as Chol. And they have all of these different kind of mythologies about these like super Ur-Maya kind of magical people of the forest who are still wandering around. Um, and so they don't really claim that ancestry. When it comes to like specific groups that we work with, we've got the Catholics, the evangelicals, we have the people who sided with the guerrillas during the Civil War, the people who sided with the army, and the people who were massacred by each of the groups. Um, each village has its own thing. Within different villages, you have certain churches that are more pow powerful that make little blocks. Um, a lot of times we, we just say, hey, we come and talk to a village and say, this, we need to work in uh, your land this year and we would like to work in like three parcelas with three kind of parcels of land we need 10 people in each land like you guys organize it but it has to have some sort of archaeology and those are the families that we end up working with the most we keep trying to make sure that we push our the development benefits 
out of just our people. Uh, but even when we say that, it took until I think eight years in that we realized that there's a huge rural homeless population that wasn't getting any of the benefits or included in any of the conversations uh, in the region just because the, the people we're relying on have their own biases and social networks and blind spots. So we're, we just kind of, at, at the end of the day, we try to work with people who want to work with us who actually have things that we would like to work on. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Yeah, the local politics can be so difficult to navigate, but finding those unifying themes, whether it's you know land, life ways, sense of place, et cetera. Um, thanks for both your talks. Thanks, David. That's a great question for us to end on. And I do see in the chat and the um, participant list that there are a few more questions lingering. Um, we unfortunately have to end now. We're quite a bit past our time, but that is just evidence that this was a really fantastic conversation. Mary created a Google Doc where we can upload some sources and things, especially for students who have questions about that kind of background. And also with their permission, I will put Rebecca and Brent in contact with our graduate and undergraduate students who might have more questions. I see thumbs up. Yes, good. Who um, might have more questions for them. Um, and maybe you can give a little more guidance in that context. Um, but thank you all so much for coming um, and to our first lecture series. And I, for me, this was a really illuminating and stimulating set of talks. So we thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. This was a lot of fun and it's great to see you all. You too. Thank you. Take care. Be well. Thanks. Bye. Bye.